Hi, I'm Claire Mary and we're in Walsingham, England and I'm with Lord David Alton for the Pro-Life Pilgrimage. We're here to talk about his political career on these issues. It's lovely to have you with us, David. Thank you, Claire. It's a pleasure. You've had quite a lengthy career uh, in terms of these issues and you have quite a story to tell. I wonder if you'd tell us a bit more about that story. Well, I think back 50 years now to 1967 when the original Abortion Act went through the House of Commons and as a schoolboy I was shocked that only 29 members of the House of Commons had voted against the second reading of that legislation. Legislation that has led to some 8 million abortions in the United Kingdom over the intervening 50 years. As a schoolboy I collected a petition which I sent off to the mover of the legislation and it became one of those issues that's always for me been a defining issue. But I think, Claire, it sits alongside a lot of other things for me. I believe passionately in the upholding of human rights. For me, the supreme human right is the right to life itself. It's Article 3 of the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights that everyone shall have the right to life. And of what use is the freedom to believe or the freedom of movement or the freedom of speech or all the other things that we hold dear if you didn't have a chance to be born in the first place? In 50 years, the context and language that's been used in the debate has changed over time. How would you define that? It's marked 50 years since the original legislation, but it's also 30 years this year since I introduced a bill in the House of Commons challenging the abortion laws. And one of the reasons I introduced it was to challenge language. People talked then, you're right, about this isn't anything other than a blob of jelly or a clump of tissue. And we produced photographs of the child in the womb at 18 weeks gestation and at that time abortions could take place up to 28 weeks gestation they can still take place up until 24 weeks gestation and in the case of a child with a disability and that can be anything from down syndrome to a club foot cleft palate hair lip up to and even during birth and the enormity of what we permit in terms of its brutality was something that i wanted to try and convey both pictorially, but also in language as well, to change the language from just talking about a blob of jelly or a clump of tissue to talking about an unborn child. Even the law accepts, as science does, that life begins at fertilisation. Otherwise, why would the law allow experiments to take place on a human embryo for the first 14 days, or 14 days after something? And the only definitive moment that you or I can look to and say, that is when I began to be me, the only watershed moment is fertilisation. So from that time, from fertilisation until natural death, from the womb to the tomb, we should have a great regard for the sanctity of human life. And as I say, it's the paramount human right. So why is it important for those who share your view to think about Walsingham and its message? Luke unlike the other three gospel writers, was a doctor. And he was the one who had a conversation with Mary because he records things at the beginning of his gospel account but are not in the other gospels. And one of them is about the encounter that Jesus has with his first witness. Jesus at this point is just what we would say is a human embryo or a fetus, an unborn child in Mary's womb. And who is the first person to greet him? John who jumps for joy in his previously infertile mother's womb, Elizabeth's womb. And we're told this. So for me to come to Walsingham, given Mary's significant place, but in, in the story of Walsingham, but also in the story of the New Testament and in the story of bringing Jesus into the world. And when you think further on, you think about the attempts to kill Jesus as soon as he was born by Herod and, and, and those who, uh, who hunted down the Holy Family, you can see why this place matters. But beyond, beyond just that, the Bible opens with the book of Genesis. And in the Bible, we are told that every person is made in the image of God. So imago Dei, we're not random, we're not just pieces of tissue, we're, we are made in God's image. And therefore we are precious and sacred to him. It's the dignity of difference the phrase that Jonathan Sachs, our chief rabbi, uses in the title of one of his books, the dignity of difference. And we've got to affirm that difference and fight for the right to life of everyone, regardless of their backgrounds. Do you know that 90%, 90% of all babies with Down syndrome are now aborted routinely before having the right to, to be born? 
the amniocentesis test is used, other tests are used to hunt down a child with Down syndrome. And when people say that they are liberals, then they need to ask themselves, what kind of liberals are they? It's coercive liberalism that says, you may not even express these views any longer. Look what people are saying about men like Jacob Rees-Mogg, or for that matter, the former leader of the Liberal Party, the Liberal Democrats in this co country, uh, Tim Farron, who, who said I could no longer lead the party because it's impossible for me to do so and reconcile it with my Christian beliefs. Something is going very badly amiss when this happens to, to people, when you've even, you can't any longer even listen to a different point of view because of the challenge it may be making to you. So one of the things I find interesting about Walsingham is many pilgrims came here to ask Our Lady to conceive. The recorded miracles are about children. And yet today, many pilgrims are here to uphold the dignity and sanctity of the unborn babies, those eight million that today we're here to make reparation about for the 50th anniversary in 2017. Many would argue that there is a direct link between the levels of abortion in Britain. Some women now have had eight legal abortions and the dangers that too many abortion can have to people's fertility. So, of course, abortion can have a negative effect psychologically, e emotionally. You can scrape a child out of the womb, but not out of the heart or mind. But it can also have a physical effect on those who are aborted. And I think that the infertility that we now increasingly see in, in, in the United Kingdom and in other Western democracies, and the child hatred that we see building up, where people say, I'm not having any children, or they say that you know, we should control the numbers of children people can have and so on, as they did in China, with the support of aid programs from many Western countries, you start to say, well, what, where have we gone? I mean, we talk about the Dark Ages and the Middle Ages, but actually, in many ways, they were more civilised than we are. You take the fertility treatments in Britain, in vitro fertilisation. Some people call it in vitro failure because IVF only works in about 20% of cases. So 80% of people will go through all of these cycles of treatment and still not be able to conceive, and it's heartbreaking for them. Meanwhile, every day, we abort 600 babies. Why are these babies not being made available for adoption for people who can't conceive? It seems to me that that would make common sense, but no, the state can't possibly accept that it would be better to allow children to be born when people insist it's just their right to choose to take that life. So it all becomes a sort of ideology. And then you see what they then do to the human embryo as well, not just it through the IVF treatments, but the so-called spare embryos, frozen embryos, the ones that are then used for experiments. Around four million have now been destroyed or experimented on, and the British Parliament even made it legal, against my strong opposition, but made it legal to create animal-human hybrid embryos, mixing animal embryos with human embryos for experimental purposes. This is debasing our country, it's debasing science as well. Good science, good ethics have got to march hand in hand. I mean, this is like people would relate this sort of thing to Frankenstein and some of those times in our scientific history when things went terribly wrong. I think people of my generation often forget uh, about our history to see where we're going, and yet would be quite shocked about some of the scientific facts that are taking place in our country at the moment, which would hold a parallel to the 1930s. Well, if you want a dystopian novel to read that is prophetic, the one I would recommend is That Hideous Strength by C.S. Lewis, which is part of his uh, cosmic trilogy. And there's even a fictional member of the House of Lords in it called Lord Feverston, who presides over a thing called NICE. And we actually have a NICE in the National Health Service today, but this is the National Institute for Coordinated Experiments. And they do some pretty hideous things. And a very bright young man working in what could be Oxford or Cambridge gets sucked into the system. Mm -hmm. And when he realises what he's connived in, he eventually says, but nobody prepared me for this, no one formed me. And in another book, C.S. Lewis writes about how our education system has mm -hmm. done precisely that. In, in, uh, he, he says that the educators have become the conditioners. And he says, we bid the gelding be fruitful and then castrate the gelding. Uh, so in, in The Abolition of Man is, is, is that book. He sets out, if you like, the theology and the anthropological arguments alongside the fiction that he has in that hideous strength. This is what was being written in the 1940s and 50s, and it's come to pass. 
G.K. Chesterton, a great Catholic convert, in 1923, the last book that he wrote uh, before becoming a Catholic was called Eugenics and Other Evils, and it predicted all the things that would happen in the 1930s here and overseas. You know, never mind what was going on in Nazi Germany. In this country, a woman called Mary Stopes was founding her uh, reproductive rights movement and clinics all over the United Kingdom today that carry out abortions day in, day out are named for Mary Stopes. She had a completely eugenic view of life. If you look at what she had to say uh, about people from minorities, what she had to say about race, uh, these are things that you know, any civilised person should be deeply ashamed of and opposed to, but instead of which we, we put her picture on a postage stamp in the United Kingdom. So I think we've taken leave of our senses. It's interesting, isn't it, that the first country to legalise euthanasia was Hitler's Germany. Um, and now Holland and Belgium, not Nazi countries, but members of the European Union that would call themselves civilised, have done exactly the same thing. In Holland, which first legalised euthanasia, 4,000 people die every year now from a lethal injection. It started by being voluntary, and now they have involuntary euthanasia. So 1,000 of the 4,000 are people who haven't even given consent to euthanasia. It started by being for adults, it now includes children. How could a civilised society do something like this? In Belgium there was a, an example of a man who was transgender, and who became deeply depressed because of one of the operations that had gone wrong. He asked the euthanasia and they said, yes, you, we can kill you. Somebody else in a prison given euthanasia because it was convenient to get hold of his organs. This is where we're going in, in this debate. Happily, perhaps having partly learnt the lesson of the slippery slope of abortion and the eight million the law of unintended consequences, I call it, because if you read the debate in 1967, it was only, they said, ever going to be in hard cases for this or that or the other. 98% of all abortions are done under the social clause that have nothing at all to do with any of the hard cases. And I think because of the fear that that would come as well through the end of life issues, the House of Commons, to its credit, and the House of Lords, have voted against the legalising of euthanasia and assisted suicide so far but I wouldn't hold your breath. I mean, I think that the day's dupes will be back again and will we'll endeavour to change the law as they did in, in Holland and in Belgium, in the state of Oregon, Wash state of Washington. It, there are too many jurisdictions that are going in that direction. And what does it lead to? It leads to people becoming depressed, believing that they have a duty to die if they're elderly, if they're disabled. The people who made the most eloquent speeches against the change of law in the British House of Lords were the most disabled members, one of whom, uh, Baroness Campbell, spoke through her oxygen mask and said, this is about people like me. We are frightened if this law goes through. So disabled people were opposed to it, the hospice movement was opposed to it, the British Medical Association was opposed to it, the Royal Colleges were opposed to it. So, so far, so good, but constantly money is pouring in through all sorts of dubious organisations to change British law and people are being subverted. So people need to pray about this but they need to work about it as well. Going back to the importance of the use of language in the context of the debate, both sides are using compassionate language and yet it's hard to differentiate without bringing God into the equation. For those listening to you today, what uh, advice would you give them if they wanted to offer practical support? You're living in a society that has decided to discard God and to lose the maker's instructions. So we don't have the maker, we don't have the maker's instructions. And if you tell people that you're passionate about this because we are all made in God's image and we are precious in his eyes and therefore we should affirm the sanctity of human life, that is no longer enough. And I think we have to be bright enough to realise that and recognise the society we live in. So I say to people, if you can demonstrate to me that science is wrong, and that life doesn't begin at fertilisation, then I'll reconsider my view. How can they? Because life begins at fertilisation. And once you start to argue, I think, from that point of view, you start getting somewhere. And then take the slogan and deconstruct the language. My right to choose. What does it mean? Me, I, at the heart of the equation. Rights, not duties or obligations, to the weak, the powerless, the voiceless. Choice comes from the same Greek root as the word heresy. Is a modern heresy. Choices carry consequences. 
Freedom for the pike is death for the minnow. Freedom for the hunter is death for the hunted. On whose side do you stand? And then compassion. This is a word that is manipulated. Is it compassionate to force a woman who often feels she has no choice into having an abortion? Or do you get alongside her and help her through that crisis? And men, it's easy for men to say, oh, go and have an abortion. And when judges rule that men have no rights over their unborn child, it suits quite a lot of men. Instead of which, men have got to understand they have a duty both to their to the woman who's become pregnant and to their unborn child. And then they might start seeing things rather differently. I mean, look, one of the organisations that I'm a patron of in, in the UK that I, I, I love is the Life Organisation. Why? Because it's pro-woman and it's pro-child. It's pro-love and it's pro-life. They set up life houses. They've got hospices for dying babies because don't just say to someone, you know, your baby is going to be... Uh, have a very short life, it's going to be very severely disabled when it's born, you've then got to stand alongside the parents in that situation and the child. Uh, what I do know is that if you tell them the only thing they ought to do at that point is to abort the child, that isn't going to help them and that isn't being compassionate. So we've got to deconstruct the language but we've also got to be active as well. You know, we built a Zoe's place in my own city of Liverpool. It cost you know, millions to build it and it was all raised voluntarily by people. When I promoted my private members of bill 30 years ago, there was a case before the courts of a young man who was at the University of Oxford, and he had got a girl pregnant. She had decided to have an abortion. He challenged this by going to court, and the judge ruled he had no say, no right, nothing to do with him. And he was pretty, felt defeated at the end of it. But the young woman approached him after the court and said, after the hearing and said, I don't love you, I'm not going to marry you, but if you're willing to bring up this child, then I will have the baby. Now that doesn't appear in the textbooks that describes the case of the Oxford student, it just tells you what happened in the court. I was asked the kind of question you just asked at a university in the north of England uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, I get told that story. It was a student audience, and I said, you may wonder sometimes what you can do. You can get alongside someone who's pregnant and tell them there is an alternative to the defeatism and the violence that abortion involves. But it means you've also got to be sacrificial. You'll have to sacrifice something to help someone in that situation. Well, at the end of the meeting, one of the academics, one of the lecturers who was at the meeting was there, and he came over and said to me, I just thought you'd like to know, I'm the Oxford student. He said, and my daughter, has just started at university. Now, I'd never met him before, but I'd told that story often because it was an encouragement to me as well. Um, and I think we do need to encourage one another. They try to silence us. That's part of, <laughs> that's part of what's happening in, in the UK today, is to try and stop debate, to try and stop people from speaking or writing. But I recently attended a, a public speaking competition for young Catholics, and they chose their own subjects. And, I was one of those who won a, one of the prizes was a young man um, from Derbyshire who took the title Be Bold, Be Brave. And he spoke about the right to speak on issues like abortion. And he was really compelling. And I thought, well, the future's in safe hands. We passed the baton on one to the other, generation to generation. Jacob Rees-Mogg's been in the news a lot recently because of his pro-life position. 30 years ago, his father, who had been the editor of the Times newspaper um, and was in the House of Lords, wrote to me and took me out for lunch and said, David, you're doing the right thing. I'd like to encourage and support you in what you're doing. And I wrote to Jacob recently and said, your father encouraged me, let me encourage you. We all just have to encourage one another in this process. It's not easy because you, you know, my, my former party, once I decided to, uh, to keep on with this issue and that I wasn't going to go away with it, and it was a conscience question, it was not a party policy, um, they decided then to make it a party policy. And I said, well, you can do that, but you, it, won't, it won't keep me. And on the very day that they passed this resolution to make it a party policy, they also passed a resolution on animal welfare. And I don't think they couldn't, had, they didn't have the sense to see the paradox. But on one hand, they were passing a resolution that included protection for goldfish being sold in plastic bags in amusement arcades and fun fairs. And in the afternoon to say, 
Not only will there be no protection, but it will be the part, this party's policy to support the destruction of human life, the unborn child. And I thought, well, if your priority are goldfish in plastic bags, then intellectually and emotionally, this I, up with this, I cannot put. <laughs> so, so that's why I left party politics. And uh, so curiously, I ended up um, for bad behaviour, perhaps with a life sentence. <laughs> In, in, still, as a, but as an independent, I sit in, in no political party. But I would encourage others, though, to you know, take up the cudgels, get involved in public or political life. That's something practical they can do. Uh, William Wilberforce, for 40 years, struggled to change people's beliefs. Why? Because they believed it was their right to choose to own another person merely because of the colour of their skin as a slave. It took him 40 years to change attitudes, to change hearts and minds, and then to change the laws. He was on his deathbed. And maybe it would, you know, one day they'll be putting up statues, I hope, to Jacob Rees Mogg, like they've been putting up statues to William Wilberforce in the past, because a different generation may see these things very differently from the way our own contemporaries do. So you've just got to keep at it. One of the lessons of Wilberforce's anti-slavery movement, of course, was that it wasn't just one person who changed the law, it was an alliance. And an incredible number of people. There were the Quaker ladies, for instance. There was a man called Thomas Clarkson who threw in his divinity studies at Cambridge University and he did the organisation up and down the country. He thought God had literally spoken to him as he was a student sitting by the river cam. And he said, no, I'm going to give my life to doing this. There was an escaped slave called Aredo Equiano who went round and showed the shackles with which he had been held. And it started to wake people up to the reality. There was a lawyer called Granville Sharp who challenged the laws in the courts. There was a businessman called Josiah Wedgwood who made hair braids and badges for people in what became the first human rights campaign ever. What did the badges say? They showed us a slave and it said, am I not a man and a brother? Well, isn't an unborn child a member of the human race with us? And don't we have a duty to speak on their behalf? So I think we can learn a lot from that period of history and there are plenty of others. Wilberforce, though, of course, also took St. Augustine seriously. Augustine said, pray as if the entire outcome depends upon God and work as if the entire outcome depends upon you. It's not one or the other, you've got to do both. From a spiritual perspective and thinking about the importance of prayer, how would you differentiate that from the educational, political and psychological way of looking at these issues? This is a spiritual battle and I, for any Christian you have to see it as the spiritual battle of our age. This is child sacrifice, Don't, let's dress it up. We're destroying 600 unborn children in the UK each and every single working day. Most of them are aborted in private clinics. The money that pours into those clinics, by the way, we're talking hundreds of millions of pounds, comes out of the National Health Service. Couldn't this money be being, being used to support women? We've just said to Northern Ireland women, you can come to Britain, to Great Britain, and have your abortions, and we will pay you 1,400 pounds a time to come to one of these clinics in a former convent or a former hosp maternity hospital to get rid of your child. Northern Ireland didn't introduce the 1967 Abortion Act. There are now over 100,000 people alive in Northern Ireland who wouldn't have otherwise been alive if they had introduced our laws there. Who's enlightened in this debate? You know, Northern Ireland is accused of being behind the times. I think, thank God, they've been behind the times. Look at all those lives that were saved. Finding radical alternatives to the defeatism that abortion represents seems to me to be the highest priority. And praying into those situations is important. Um, people change their minds, and they have done over the years. One of the most influential um, short movies that's ever been shown is a thing called The Silent Scream. And this shows what happens in an abortion, but how, why was that made? It was made by a man called Bernard Nathanson, who was the leading abortionist in New York. He'd carried out thousands upon thousands of abortions. And he was do making a, a short movie to show how easy it was to, to put the pliers-like instruments into the womb, to hunt down the child, to, to do the dilation evacuation, to pull the child apart, no anaesthetics used. And he saw this on the, the movie that he was making, he could see the child trying to escape from his instruments. It changed his mind and he beca became one of the leading pro-life advocates in the United States. And that little movie is available on YouTube. People to this day see it. So 
You've got to keep praying that people will change their mind and that they will use their own experiences to talk about what it was that they were involved in. Look, all of us make terrible mistakes in our lives. That isn't, we're not condemning, we're not judging. That's not what this is about. This is about upholding the sanctity of human life and helping people through a crisis. It's also not turning men and women who should be defenders of human life. Medicine's the highest calling you could possibly have, not turning them into destroyers of human life. So I think there's a, this is the great battle of our age. Um, and we would, Christians should keep on praying and praying about it. And there are many religious communities I know that keep this very high on their agenda, but it gave me certainly encouragement today. Barnabas, one of the great figures in the New Testament, why the son of encouragement. It was encouraging today to see people here in their hundreds in Walsingham who were praying and who were recognising also the enormity of what it is that we have permitted. Um, you, you think back to men like Maximilian Kolbe. He knew when he spoke out that he was signing his own death warrant. But he spoke out in a, his journal, it was called Night, uh, read by hundreds of thousands of people in Poland. And he said, beyond the hecatombs of the extermination camps, he said, two irreconcilable enemies lie in the depths of every soul. He said, of what use are we with the victories on the battlefield if we're defeated in our innermost personal selves? So we have to, there is an inner struggle. Look, I would rather not have come up in the private members battle ballot. I was enjoying myself doing things in politics. But I knew that this wasn't a trivial question. And in the end, you have to struggle. And you have to, you have to say, well, I know this is going to mean, that it's going to be difficult in, in political life, but so what in the end? And I think that doesn't make you particularly courageous. I just think it means you got that bit right. And I think we've got to encourage one another uh, to try and get that bit right. So what has been your highlight for today? Today, well, just coming back to Walsingham, because 30 years ago, at the height of my bill, I came with a colleague who was a Conservative Member of Parliament, a very committed Catholic called Ken Hargreaves, who was the Member of Parliament uh, for Accrington in Lancashire, the Sacred County. And Ken and I walked from the Slipper Chapel uh, to the Priory, and as an act of reparation, but also to in, we knew that we had a huge battle immediately ahead of us. And we became firm friends as a result of that. He became godparent to one of my children. Um, he had what people would call a good death. Um, a couple of years ago, people lined the streets in his town uh, to say their farewells to him. He was the classic good member of parliament in, in my view. And it became, it was for me a, a great moment to, to work with him, but, uh, but this is not a battle for people to stay away from. If we were asking Our Lady to speak into the conversation and for the purpose of our viewers today, what do you think she might be saying to us? I think she would say, think of all the broken hearts. Think of all the sorrow. Think of the distress that this has caused. Think of the healing that is needed. And I think that we, in our passion to see laws change, attitudes change, we should never forget that. And I think Mother that she is, uh, the Blessed Mother would be saying to us, Never forget the healing that is needed in your nation. And this is a great nation, and it's an, a, a nation that has historically honoured God. The footprint of Christianity in this historic town of Walsingham could not be clearer, but the brokenness is there as well. And yet, there's new life here. And maybe that's also what Our Lady is saying to us, that there will be new life. And of course, the, the, the story always has been that this, this country uh, will will return to, to Mary when it returns to Walsingham. So that's another good reason for us being here. Thanks so much, Lord Alton, for being with us today. today. Pleasure.